morning and thank you for joining us for this week's service, whether you call Epicenter your church or it's your first time joining us. We are excited to be starting on our new series, Wisdom, where we'll be talking about the different areas of life with the potential to lift us up or weigh us down depending on the choices we make. From family to parenting to friendships, work, money, and more. For today, we will be doing an overview of the difference between experiences and wisdom and the value of wisdom and understanding. As we go through the message, we want to encourage you to follow along with your Bibles and jot down some notes on your worship program. If you have kids that are between the ages of 4 and 6th grade, we have Epicenter Kids currently taking place and your kids can join them at any time during the service. If you have newborns to 3 year olds that would like some space to move around, the parent room is available and you can view and listen to the message from there. If you'd like something to keep your kids busy during the service, we have sketch pads that are available at the info table for them to use throughout the service. I'm thinking about divorcing her. My kids are out of control. I'm not hurting anyone with my choices. I thought they were my friends. Should I quit my job? I'm just going to wing it. I don't want to work anymore. Follow your passion. Believe you can do it and you will. Everything happens for a reason. Fake it till you make it. Be yourself. Take risk. Never give up. any good to sit here whining about it we're in a hole we're just gonna have to dig ourselves out okay all right you're right you're absolutely right boy where are you going home i'm walking home oh well pardon me mr perfect i guess i forgot that you never ever make a mistake Got room for one more if you still want to go to Aspen. Where did you find that? Some kid back in town. Traded the van for it straight up. I can get 70 miles to the gallon on this hog. You know, Lloyd, just when I think you couldn't possibly be any dumber, you go and do something like this. And totally redeem yourself. <laughs> Good reminder from Lloyd there that we are only human, right? Uh, and we make mistakes. So that's one of the things that we do. While being human doesn't help us in our situations, a lack of wisdom is really what breaks us. Sometimes our, our constant blunders aren't simply attributed to our humanity, that we're human. But it's a byproduct of foolishness and insanity. It could be a lack of common sense, listening to bad advice, or repeating the same cycle with the expectation of a different outcome. Just when we think we can't be any dumber, we prove and we totally redeem our humanity. We're just humans. So every day we're faced with scenarios that require choices. And this happens in our homes, it happens in our work, school, when we go shopping, relationships, you're, you're making decisions constantly. We don't give it much thought, but we're making choices that 
actually play a factor not only in how the rest of our day is going to pan out from the moment that you wake up until the moment that you go to sleep, but there are significant choices that we make in life that sometimes will actually affect the trajectory of our lives in the days or even in the years to come. A compromise today can determine can be the determining factor for our lives falling apart in the future. A wise decision today could be the reason that you're spared from difficulty and heartache tomorrow. When it comes to decision making, there's many things that play a factor in how we're going to decide and how we're going to choose. Our decisions could be based off of gut instinct, what seems to be the most convenient or beneficial at the time, the experiences of others, or even personal experiences that we've had in the past. So those are four different ways that I just mentioned that we make decisions on a daily basis. Now, the problem with most of these things is that none are really reliable. Our gut instinct could simply be digestive issues that you have to go to the hospital for, right? It's not foolproof. The odds that you're making a good decision based on your gut is 50-50. There is a 50% chance that you're going to make a good decision, but you have just as high of a percentage of a chance of ruining your life based on those statistics. 50-50. Now, the second way that we make decisions is by making decisions based on what is the most convenient or beneficial at the moment that we're making that decision, which is actually the worst way to choose. This is the reason that most companies use this as a marketing tool. Credit cards use this as their primary way of getting you. You buy now, you pay later. We do this in our choices. In other words, we're going through this scenario and we justify it because it's convenient at this moment. You're going to have to pay for it later, buddy. This is just simply a marketing tool that is convenient. At the moment, you get what you want, but in the long run, you pay for that convenience. Sometimes other people get to steer the boat in how you will decide, whether it be family or friends. Sometimes it's mom and dad. Sometimes it's the BFF. And they do this based on their experiences. And based on their experience, they suggest that you fill in the blank. Now, this probably seems like the most foolproof uh, way than trusting your indigestion, but it all depends on the person that is giving you the advice to begin with. And even if it's a person that is reliable, the unfortunate part is that the outcome is going to vary no matter what. And here's the reason why. Because we're different people with different circumstances. We're not the same person. And there's going to be factors in there that may have worked for them, but it's not going to work for you. So now, what if we moved away from the experiences that others have had to our own personal experiences, and we make choices based off of that in the past? We base it off of experience. My mom... I had to call her and double check to make sure that this was the way that the saying went. But my mom has a saying that says, El diablo sabe más por viejo que por diablo. She doesn't speak English, so I'll translate. Uh, what it means is, the, devil's no, the devil knows more from being old than from being the devil. Let me break it down on what it means. Sometimes our understanding is not based on who we are, but from how long we've lived. The devil knows more from being old than from being the devil. We're talking about experience. Now, the problem with this is that regardless of how old you get, or in this case, no matter how old the devil is, he's still a fool. You could be old and still be a fool. There is a well-known Bible verse in, in the book of Psalms that, that states this. It says, only fools say in their hearts there is no God. It seems disconnect, disconnected from what we're talking about, but this is a verse that we often see as a, a great passage to point atheists to, as they hold the view that there is no God. So that's what makes them fools. When we think, or even when we try to define the word fool, we often think of somebody that is mentally incompetent or even 
is incoherent in their arguments. Now, going back to that verse, if you have ever had a conversation with an atheist, which I have, you will quickly learn that they are actually well studied and versed up in the areas of science and even religion. As a matter of fact, I would say that some atheists put Christians to shame. So, one of the things that we could say is that they aren't fools by our standard of definition. Because we think that it's somebody that's incoherent. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't make any sense. Now, they don't make any sense in some way, but they know what they're talking about. So, based on this, I would make the argument that you could believe in God and still be a fool. And here's another way that we could see this. In the book of James, he writes in chapter 2, verse 19, talking about people of faith. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. So understand this. A person is not simply defined as wise or foolish based on their belief, but on what they do with that belief. So let's go back to Psalms chapter 14, verse 1, and read it in context. Only fools say in their heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and their actions are evil. Not one of them does good. Now we're seeing that foolishness is not defined whether you're making a coherent argument or if you're knowledgeable in an area. A fool is one who continues to live as though there is no God. He continues to go down the path of living like a fool. Wisdom is not acquired by how long you've lived if you continue to live in the absence of God. When my mom uses that saying, it proves two things. I'm glad that she's not here because I could say it confidently. But you can live longer than others, just like she has, and still be objectively and biblically wrong. And here's the reason why. Without even going to the Bible, so my mom has a saying, once again, uh, the devil knows more from being old than from being the devil. And it's objectively wrong. It's biblically wrong. And here's the reason why, once again, the devil is still a fool, no matter how old, he's, how old he is. But here's the way that you could objectively see this without going to the Bible. It can go without saying that there are many white-haired old people whose longevity has not helped them in their decision-making. Am I right? Right? There's old people that are still fools. That's not me ripping on old people. I'm just saying, you could be old and still be foolish. Now, here's the thing. No doubt that our past mistakes and experiences can help shape our decision-making in the future, However, it is not always a guarantee that there will still be wise decisions. Sometimes we're so convinced that we are knowledgeable that because my mom and I typically kind of get into this because she's like, I've lived longer than you, I'm older, I know. And sometimes I'm like, mom, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not bashing what you know. But sometimes we're so convinced in our reasoning from our past experiences, you know, like for my mom, Vicks solves everything. That, that's her mindset. Uh, the kids have a stomachache, put Vicks on them. Uh, do they have a cold? Put Vicks on them. Anything is Vicks. But sometimes we're so convinced by the reliability of our reasoning and past experiences that we actually think that we don't need any steering in any direction from anyone. We're wise. We know. We've lived longer than you. We know. This is what Proverbs chapter 26, verse 12 states. There is more hope for fools than for people who think they are wise. There is always room for improvement. I will always have room for improvement. It doesn't matter if you're in your dying bed, you will always have room for improvement. Because making decisions is actually not difficult. We make them all the time. The problem is, Making wise decisions is difficult. So whether you think that you're the wisest person in the room 
<laughs> like my mom does. Um, or you feel like you're the greatest fool to ever walk the face of the earth. One of the things that I want you to understand is your track record, right? Your, your past track record of, of how good you've done can easily be overshadowed by one foolish decision. You could be do, making wise decision 97% of the time. It just takes 3% to ruin that perfect record. And the other thing is, now if you're on the other side of the spectrum like I am, your messy past doesn't have to define you as a fool for the rest of your life. That's what we're talking about today and separating these things. One of the things that we do is similar to like when we think about fools, that it's people that once again are incoherent, they, they have no knowledge at all. We often define wisdom wrong as well. Once again, as stated already, atheists, there, there's many atheists. They believe that there is no God who are well-studied. They're intelligent individuals. So here's the difference. We think that wisdom is being smart, but you can be smart and still be a fool. Similar to the word fools, the characteristic of being smart is typically what we associate with being wise. They're smart. They're wise. It's not the same thing. There's two different things. Let me give you a couple of examples. You can know how to build a rocket and still be oblivious in how to build a marriage that is worth having. One requires smarts, one requires wisdom. You can know how to fix a car and still don't know how to fix your spending habits. One requires knowledge, the other one requires wisdom. You can even be wise enough to know what the right thing to do is, but still be a fool. We, we can still know what the right thing is and still do the wrong thing. Do you understand that wisdom is not being smart? Wisdom is far greater than smart or intelligent. The, the word wisdom comes from the word kochma. And it's defined, this is the way that the Bible defines it, or the concordance defines it. It is defined as having a good sense in doing the right things. It's ethics. This is the way that it breaks it down. It is a, it is a skill required in war, in administration, and in faith. If, if it's still not registering how they're different, let me just give you one more example. Intelligence will help you to understand the logistics of a war, but wisdom is what is required to win it. You can know everything about a war, but if you don't know how to win it, you're lacking wisdom. You're not lacking intelligence or information. You can be intelligent and still be a fool. And that's the reason that the Bible, and as we're going through this series, the Bible is encouraging us to seek wisdom. Wisdom is so valuable, it's so important, that Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 says this. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. Once you know what the wise thing is, you have to develop good judgment to put wisdom into practice. So as we're going to be seeing in the week, weeks ahead, as we're continuing on this series, when wisdom dictates our choices, there's often areas in our life, actually every area in our life, that become burdens and create conflict. Areas of conflict in our marriage, in our family, in our relationships, work, money, right? We could go on. These are areas that it doesn't take much and we realize that we're just burdened by these things because our marriage is falling apart, because our finances are not where we want them to be. We hate our job, right? There's just an, an array of things. Now, here's the thing that we're going to be going through in this series. When we make wise decisions in these areas, it's not going to completely drain life of difficulties, but those difficulties that do exist will become more manageable and they will become less burdensome. For next week, I already know where we're going and ladies, I'm just giving you a heads up. I'm not picking on you. It actually is 
50-50. <laughs> but, you know, the, the topic is happy wife, happy life. We have these ideas that it's like, hey, as long as we can kind of navigate this, we're good. And we do this in every area of life. Once again, when wisdom dictates our choices, these areas operate differently. Once again, it doesn't mean that there's no difficulties. They just operate differently. One example, even outside of marriage, and we're going to be tackling this topic as well with finances, but when people find themselves struggling financially, and I have found myself there, and understand that just because I'm talking about these things, it's not because I figured them out. Because I'm just, I make foolish decisions just, just like everybody else in the room. But it's because this is what the Bible teaches. And, and when we put that into practice, we see that things begin to change. But one struggle, especially with the economy being what it is, you know, finances seem to be a big issue. So we often think of financial issues as wealth being the answer, more money. And I'm not going to get into this topic very deep, but the answer to happiness and to your financial issues is not money. I know it sounds dumb, but at the same time, give me a second here. The solution to our problems is not more money. The solution to our problems is how we, or the solution to our financial strain is learning how to manage the money that we do have and how to spend the money that we do have which once again, we're going to be talking about in the near future. Most people make rash, foolish decisions that ruin their lives. Some will find themselves in, in the brink of their marriage collapsing, or if not, once again, just facing bankruptcy, just being at the, at, at the doorstep of bankruptcy. And typically when that happens is one of two things. We blame others, or if not, we, we look to God and, and we blame him. And rather than seeing how our choices dictated the outcome, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 3 tells us that people ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. Have you ever met those people? It's kind of like, well, God did this. Did you make any bad decisions in, in that time frame that maybe you contributed to the issue? Now, once again, while all of us have and likely will make more foolish decisions because we're human. When we make those foolish decisions, and as we're looking at wisdom, a great starting point for how to move forward as we're moving through this series is by owning up to your own foolishness. Stop blaming God for your foolish decisions. Stop blaming others for your foolish decisions. The place that we may find ourselves today is not God's doing. While other people may have played a factor and a role in, in that decision that you made, everyone has a choice. We often find ourselves making bad decisions, and it's similar to like in the garden, right? When you have Adam and Eve, and what happens is rather than owning up, hey, I should have been stronger and actually like just owned up to that mistake, what happens? Well, it's a woman that you gave me. Well, it was a serpent. We just blame, keep on passing the blame. So once again, not to say that there is no factors that play into the decision-making, but you have to start by owning up to your own foolishness. Let me repeat it again. People ruin their lives by their own foolishness. Now, here's the thing that, once again, we're all in different stages of life. But a fool is not labeled a fool because of their epic failure. Now, the world will label you a fool based on that one failure, no doubt. But a fool is, biblically, a fool is not labeled a fool because they screwed up once. As a matter of fact, the prodigal son becomes a perfect, perfect example. He was with the father, departs, and kind of just goes and wastes all his money and spends it on prostitutes and just plunges into foolishness. But... He comes back. A fool is not labeled a fool because of their epic failure, but their unwillingness to recognize their foolishness and turn from it. They're seeing that their lives are falling apart, 
but they're still being fools. They're still plunging into stupidity. So whether you find yourself having made foolish decisions that maybe have ruined your life or affected your life, or simply find yourself at the crossroads of needing to make an important decision, here is the reason that we're going through the book of Proverbs uh, that talks about wisdom. It says, Listen as wisdom calls out. Hear as understanding raises her voice. On the hilltop along the road, she takes her stand at the crossroads. By the gates at the entrance to the town, on the road leading in, she cries out loud. Here's wisdom crying out. I call to you, to all of you. I raise my voice to all people, not to some, to all. And here's the distinction. You simple people use good judgment. You foolish people show some understanding. It doesn't mean that the fool can't, be, can't change their trajectory. Wisdom is calling. Listen to me. This is wisdom. For I have important things to tell you. Everything I say is right, for I speak the truth and detest every kind of deception. As we're going through this series, once again, if you're, sometimes it's like, well, you've made foolish decisions. How can you speak of wisdom? Because wisdom is absolute. This is not my view. As a church, we talk a lot about grace and mercy that is available for everyone that is willing to accept it. And we often think about foolishness as something that is indefinite. In other words, you already did it, it happened, it's done. There's no grace and mercy at times. But here's the message that the church preaches. Just like grace and mercy is available for everyone who is willing to accept it, wisdom calls out for everyone to hear. The fool is the one who rejects wisdom even when life is falling apart. Guiding us in truth so that we can avoid that deception. So wisdom, once again, is available for everyone. And it, that's what we're talking about. Wisdom redirects us. It aligns us in the path that brings spiritual, rich, fulfilling lives. So as we're going through this series, we're not doing a study on the book of Proverbs. We're simply going to be jumping around to different topics that are relevant to our lives. But Proverbs is the focal point. And that's what we're going to be kind of camping out at. So it's important to know why Proverbs is written, right? I mean, we're going to be, this is a book of wisdom written by King Solomon. So here's King Solomon, who the book of Ecclesiastes is written by him as well. The majority of the book of Proverbs is written by King Solomon. But here you have King Solomon who plunges into every kind of stupidity, right? He, he tries to acquire as much wealth for, for happiness. He has almost 1,000 uh, women in combination with being married and concubines. Like, here's a guy that, that has tried everything. So you could actually say that he's a, while there's wisdom, he plunges into foolishness. But this is the reason that he writes it. He writes uh, in, starting in verse 1, of Proverbs chapter 1, it says, These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. The purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline and to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives. Most people want successful lives, but they don't want to live disciplined lives. Wisdom is what leads to success. Now, I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel. I'm not talking about, well, if you do this, you're going to become rich. Once again, the answer is not money. It's how you spend that money that you do have. The book is written to help us do what is right, just, and fair. So the purpose of this series is that, to learn wisdom and encourage all of us to develop good judgment. And that way we could put it into practice in every area, every area of our lives, in our homes, work, schools, and public spaces. So the biggest difference between experience and wisdom, this is important. 
The biggest difference is that one is defined by our broken human experiences that are not so reliable, while wisdom goes beyond my, yours, King Solomon's experiences and shifts us to divine revelation and guidance from the architect of humanity that defines the purpose for it. I'm not telling you what you should do. I am simply looking at the blueprint for what we should do. There's a difference. I can tell you, well, I had this scenario and this is what I did. There's nothing wrong with giving guidance from different experiences that we've had. What we need is not experiences. We need wisdom in how to handle those situations. And while we're broken individuals who will find ourselves making foolish choices, the purpose of the study, again, is not to dwell on the foolish decisions we've made that we can't change because they're going to be there, but it is to learn from those experiences and to move forward in forming decisions based on wisdom. Step one in moving in that direction, like I said, is owning up to the reality that we made bad decisions, that we might make bad decisions again, that we're broken human beings who are in desperate need, not only of wisdom, which is knowing the right thing to do, but in help in doing those right things. But more importantly, this is kind of how I want to close it up today. More importantly, we have to recognize that we are broken and we are in a desperate spiritual state of needing to be saved. And I know that that's a huge shift from what we're talking about to what I'm talking about now, but, but it all correlates. And here's the reason why. As we're going through this series, we're, we're talking about things that are practical, that influence our lives. Our country was established on moral principles that were derived from Christianity. If we look at the founding fathers, they actually derived a lot of the Constitution based on Christian principles and morality. Now, here's the thing. As we're going through this series, you don't have to be a Christian to put these into practice and make life easier. Once again, even the founding fathers of the U.S. ultimately base the principles based on Christian practices. And you don't have to be a Christian for things to go right. Now, here's the thing, though. If you're not a Christian and you put these things into practice, it may make life easier here on earth, but it does not guarantee eternal peace. And and at times as a church, we tend to focus the messages on, the church tends to focus the message on rules of conduct and morality more than the gospel. And and I want to pause there because it can rub people the wrong way when I say that. I'm not suggesting that there is anything wrong with talking about rules of conduct and morality biblically. I'm not saying that. But they are part of the gospel, but they are not the gospel. What tends to happen within the church is that we have people that learn how, what the moral rules are, and all that they do is simply figure out a way to shift that. So we, we're still breaking the law, but we're breaking it in a different way. I've used this example multiple times, but... Um, Jesus, uh, two of the main commandments that Jesus actually tackles is uh, murder and adultery. And murder, Jesus says, if you, look at, or if you hate your brother in your heart, you are guilty of murder. Adultery, if you look at a woman with lust, you're guilty of adultery. So one of the things that we talk about is we talk about these moral laws and we train people to think that because of how good they are, they're going to get to heaven. Once again, this is not encouraging people to plunge into foolishness, but if you're not a Christian and you come into the church and you're hearing these teachings, your marriage might get better, your work might get better, all these things may get better, but here's the thing, that doesn't mean that you're saved. We tend to blur the lines between the gospel and morality. While the gospel addresses conduct, The the rules of conduct and morality are essential to the gospel because as we accept Jesus into our heart, those things change. 
the gospel in and of itself is not how we can fulfill these things perfectly, but in how Jesus already did. Because he became the perfect sacrifice to free us from the penalty of death. So once again, the reason I'm shifting this is you don't have to be a Christian to put these things into practice. But when we accept this message of salvation that shifts us from eternal damnation to eternal salvation, we are filled with God's Spirit who empowers us to live in wisdom rather than fools. Unfortunately, this doesn't mean that we're no longer going to make foolish decisions. Sometimes people think when I become a Christian, I'm no longer going to sin. No, that's impossible because we're still broken people. And we still have the ability to choose in our broken state. But two things. When we come into Christ, when we come in Christ, now we have the Holy Spirit, the advocate, who will convict us. That means that you, feel, you will feel guilty for the things that you know you're not supposed to be doing, but you're doing them. And when that conviction happens, it's going to redirect us from continuing to live like fools to now be convicted and be wise in our decisions. The second thing is the, the eternal debt that we could not repay has been taken care of, not because of our good standing of conduct or morality, but because of the work of Jesus Christ accomplished at the cross. 